This episode of More Stories with the great Bun B. Brought to you by Stamps.com with the holidays almost here. You don't have time to go to the post office. Traffic, parking, standing in line. It's going to be packed with everyone mailing holiday gifts. Do what I do. Go to Stamps.com instead. With Stamps.com, you can avoid all the hassles of going to the post office. You can do everything right from your desk. Buy and print official U.S. postage using your own computer and printer. Print postage for any letter or package the instant you need it, and then the mailman picks it up. It's easy and convenient. I use Stamps.com, and I want you to use it too. Right now, get this special offer. When you use my last name, Moore, M-O-H-R, you get a $110 bonus offer. That includes a digital scale and up to $55 free postage. Don't wait. Go to Stamps.com before you do anything else. Click on the microphone at the top of the homepage and type in my last name, Moore, M-O-H-R. Stamps.com, enter more. DollarShaveClub.com. These guys are the best. They deliver amazing quality razor blades and other bathroom goodness right to your door for just a couple bucks a month. I speak from experience. These are the best, cheapest razor blades I have ever used in my life. No more going to the store and asking them to unlock the razor blades. Everybody is getting their DollarShaveClub.com blades, and you should too. Get this. Dollar Shave Club heard about the amazing mustache I'm growing for Movember to raise money to fight cancer, so they reached out to sponsor me. Every one of you that signs up with the promo code J, J-A-Y, at DollarShaveClub.com, they're going to donate $10 to my Movember team, 10 bucks to help fight cancer. That's awesome. Let's make a difference. Go sign up now at dollarshaveclub.com with the promo code J. We get a $10 donation. You get amazing razors for a few bucks a month. That's the promo code J. Shave time, shave money, dollarshaveclub.com. Come see me do live stand-up comedy at the Brea Improv Sunday, November 24th. Let's go, everybody. Let's do it. Sunday, November 24th, I am at the Brea Improv in Brea, California. Also, if you guys want to hit up the site, jmore.com, see all my live dates, New merchandise store. The more store is open for business. We got brand new tees, and we got a great new lady tee. Where are the ladies at? My wife designed a great female Moorier shirt. You guys are going to love it. These are great. Go to jmore.com. Also, don't forget to hit that Amazon banner and email me what you bought. Uh, maybe buy Bun B's new CD, and then email me what you bought, and I will read it on the air, making you famous. All things flow through jmore.com. Now, for the love of Pete, enjoy this free podcast. Put your name on it. Just put your name on it. That's all I say. Be a man or a woman. Put your name on it. Well, I'd like to hear about it, potheads. How the fuck you gonna know how to be great if you don't study greatness? Look at the game change. No nuts. If you want a battle, we see that that's your will that you're You know, you're not a bad looking man, Mr. Gals. But you are, Blanche. You are in that chair. There's something wrong with us. Something very, very wrong with us. Hey, man. More Stories Podcast, Fake Mustache Studios, all things flow through jmore.com. Don't forget to use that Amazon banner at jmore.com. Go to jmore.com, click the Amazon banner, and you can buy Bun B. His new album is called Epilogue. You can buy it off of uh, Amazon. Go to jmore.com, click the Amazon banner. Bun B, Houston rapper. What's up, partner? What's going on, Jay, man? I'm really glad to sit and talk with you. I got so many questions. You are, by the way, the first hip hop artist we've had on the podcast. Yeah, we've had uh, we've had uh, many a brother. We've had uh, Black Comics. We've had Bootsy Collins, who sold brother number one. Obviously, that's, that's the ultimate brother. But and he was great. He was a lot of fun, man. He we got down in the garage with Bootsy. But we're now live from Houston, and uh, when you go to Houston, it's been made very clear to me. I said it during the show, Jay Moore Sports. As KRS-One said, where's your respect on the block? That's mm. hot. Uh, ticket sales, album sales, uh, it don't matter. Your respect on the block when it comes to Houston, Texas as a whole. Bun B, uh, B-U-N dash B. Uh, no one, I don't think, and I'm being serious, I don't know if anybody has more respect on the block in Texas than you. There's, there's probably one person. Who? That's Jay Prince, uh, the owner and founder of Rap A Lot Records. He gives everybody in Houston history credibility. But let's say you, what's his name? Jay Prince. Let's say you uh, just decide Jay Prince, move over, Bun B's running uh, Rap-A-Lot Records. You could probably take that over with the Bun B trail. Eh, it's oh. probably a little easier said than done. 
Yeah? Yeah, probably a lot easier said than done. Why do you think it is when people think of, uh, it's always East Coast, West Coast, and when people think about Southern rap, it's always, uh, you know, it's always Atlanta, Georgia, it's always Outkast, it's always, you know, right. guys like that. Why does Texas, there's so many rappers that come out of Houston and all over, Brownsville, Tyler, uh, Silby, you know, Dallas, there's so many Texas rappers on the map, Pimp C, your homeboy from way back. And uh, and for the listener, I'm not talking black. This is uh, he's his homeboy from way back. I don't want to be. There's nothing worse. Uh, and I'll get back to the question. Then when you sit down, when you do you do a ton of radio for promotions. Oh, when the white radio guys like Bun B, homie, what's up? Yeah, just you know, just let that go. Let it go. Just, yeah, just just be you. We I can I can relate. Why doesn't uh, Houston rap get more cred when people talk about Dirty South? Like Houston putting out way more product than any other southern state in right. the United States. Would you agree? Yeah, I think, but I think that's got a lot to do with how the product is put out. Most of what we do in Houston is more so independent-based. So a lot of the guys, even though they have commercial success, they may not end up on um, a major recording label. And that's got a lot to do with proximity. We're kind of just far away from a lot of what happens in the entertainment industry here in, in Texas. Um, that doesn't mean that guys don't have, you know, g- great success. They don't make a comfortable living. You know, there's a lot of guys here that live great. You know, the cost of living is cheap, so you don't have to pay as much for a lot of stuff. But, um, yeah, it's just really more of um, a lot of these guys, they, they make their bones outside of the outside of the system. So sometimes the system kind of, you know, shits on them a little bit. It's more of a mixtape culture, isn't it? Well, I wouldn't say mixtape culture. It's just more of a mixtape mentality yeah. as far as just getting the music directly to the people. So you don't have to be with, like, DreamWorks, Universal. Nah. Or you can make a living, a good living, you're saying, in Houston. You, you got, which, What I'm hearing from Bun B mm-hmm. is that uh, Houston operates independent of the corporate umbrella that all the other rappers have to subscribe to and make happy. Right. Houston... Uh, deserves all the credit in the world, even more so from what you're telling me right now. Houston doing it on their own, independent contract in their own hip hop. Yeah, because you know, for a lot of these guys here, they don't, you know, they don't get to make the relationships with the guys, the big name A and R's and guys with record companies. So, you know, here they're more concerned about making a relationship, building relationships with you know wholesalers, um, record stores, one stops, you know, radio station personalities, people like that. They they've learned to be more personable with professional people in their immediate circles as opposed to trying to win somebody over in new york or la who probably doesn't care either way how many live shows do you do a year oh man um at least a hundred um depending on if there's a new album out then anywhere between maybe 120 to 150 a year now how important is that to record sales for you personally, like, do you have to go do live shows to make sure the record gets pushed? Because now you don't have a record company, as we've established, setting you up with, like, then you stop here, then you go right. here, then you got to meet the A&R people for this place. For you, Bun B, if you're going to go play a, a club and uh, go do your thing, how important is it to you? Obviously, I know you want to do your rhymes and right. spit in front of a live crowd. How important is it for you in your wallet to get in front of those? I know you want to make the people happy and entertain them, and you want them to hear your music. But, you know, just straight up, how important is it to your bank account to get out there in front of those people and make them move their feet? Well, I mean, I think, you know, you can probably relate to this, Jay. If you put out a comedy album, it's going to sell X amount of albums, and you're going to make, you know, a decent amount of money off the album, but you're going to make a lot more money touring. Yeah. And that's kind of how it is in music. You know, you put the album out to basically reignite the fan base to want to see you in concert. So the, the album is almost a byproduct of the performance nowadays because for me i don't you know i tour for example i haven't had an album in three years i haven't put out an album in three years i still do 100 dates a year so having a new album out doesn't you know having an album and doing shows aren't necessarily you know i don't need both of them at the same time right you know but you do a new album that reinvigorates the fan base they're like oh man he's back again you Bring in a few new people, but it's really more about feeding the core and exciting the core fan base to want to still come out and see you in shows. Because you, you sell the album, then you do the shows, you're selling merchandise, yeah. that kind of a thing. So, you know, and, and you're selling it twice because you've already sold the album to the people that are coming to see you at the show. But the show costs, you know, maybe, you know, three times, four times more than the album did. The T-shirt costs twice as much. So that's, you know, that's the, the ancillary profits become the main profits. Yeah, I can speak from experience. When I had a book out, 
and I would do stand-up comedy, then uh, Simon & Schuster was my publisher at the time, they would just ship like 300 books to the comedy club, and my meet and greet, there was a cash register, a person from Simon & Schuster, and you sold more books than you would sell in the bookstore just because everyone wants you to sign the book. Really... They're paying for the handshake. That's all that is. But if they got to buy a book, if they got to buy a CD or a DVD to get to the handshake, so be it. So also, I don't think many rappers are using ancillary profit in their day-to-day conversation. (laughs) Bun B, uh, uh, the listeners should know, Bun B, uh, and if you have not heard Bun B uh, rap or rhyme or uh, the beats he puts down, it's incredible. Uh, He is really, really a a great rapper and a great producer. And But the fact is, you're, you're... you're an educated guy, and I want to dive deep into hip hop. And I'm a white kid from the suburbs. Okay. And I grew up with hip hop. To me, my sisters are older than me. They were listening to Planet Patrol. That was like the the little feeder, like wow. right wave, boom, boom, Planet yeah. Rock, and you don't stop. And I was like, okay, this is different. That was the new right. stuff, different right? Different sounds. Yeah. And uh, then all of a sudden, uh, you start trickling in. And then, like, Blondie, she rapped on an album. That's right. And then you had uh, Run DMC, the way, way, the first first album that nobody had. Then the Beastie Boys come along. Three white guys. They're just acting like idiots. They're just smoking dope. They're smoking crack on Drinking a train. Beer. Now, how much of your audience live is white? Um, in 2013, um Probably at least 30 to 40%. Now, how much of your record sales are white? Because it seems like, and bear with me on this, it seems like hip-hop was, try, they, the mainstream tried to keep hip-hop as this niche, this thing, like breakdancing, like this thing, or, or tagging. It tried to keep it off to the side, right. off to the side. But then you got the Beastie Boys. Now, all of a sudden, every 14, 15-year-old kid in 1988, that album sold like 20 million copies. Now you just cannot deny the fact that here is a very viable uh, part of music that right. cannot. Now you got like Public Enemy going into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, stuff like that. So did you see benefits from white audiences, from the suburbs of places like Wisconsin, Minnesota, New York, New Jersey, California, did you personally go, holy smokes, we're moving a lot of units. Thank goodness uh, these these white kids are hip. Well, yeah, I mean, it's all about disposable income. You know, that's how you sell records. You know, you know, you're selling records to people that can afford to buy records. And young white kids in suburbia are usually the kids with the most <clears throat> most access to money, most disposable income. And they're the guys that are going to spend that money without question, without even thinking twice. They're going to buy the album. They're going to buy the T-shirt. They're going to come to the show. That's who's going to support the the culture uh, monetarily. So the, the, <clears throat> it's a little bit separated from maybe the practitioner. But that's just common culture. Everybody wants to be a part of that rock and roll lifestyle. And in 2013, hip hop is the hip hop rapper is the new rock star. Yeah. So you know he's the guy with the big house, with the limo, with the chicks. You know, he, even nowadays they're wearing the leather pants and everything. Rappers are wearing. <laughs> you know, like Kanye says, everybody's wearing leather jogging pants nowadays. You know, so. Uh, it, it it kind of comes back to, you know, who can afford to be a part of the party, you know. And then, you know, white kids are a little bit more anxious to want to be a part of it, whereas black kids in 2013 are maybe jaded. It's like, well, you know, I, I can listen to it, but I don't necessarily, I, I know what that is. I know what it is. I, I, I live that, you know. Other people be like, I need to listen to that so I can kind of understand what it is. But that's all that is. And w- But it's always been like that. It's not a new thing. White kids have always had more money than black kids to buy shit. Yeah. And and we're not going to talk about race the whole time, but it is important, especially in hip-hop. It seems when when the Beastie Boys came out, and especially Eminem, was there pushback from the black hip-hop community uh, immediately or a guy – like the Beastie Boys was fun. And that was fun. And Brass Monkey, the the brothers that I know and the the friends that I have that are black, they'll go like – Oh man, Brass Monkey comes on, it's all over. Or the beat for Paul Revere, like it just oh, it's, it's, it's yeah. just undeniable. Well, I however, think- with that, real quick, with Eminem, what I've always said is I think personally, Eminem, by the way, all time top five greatest MCs. Oh, without question. But there's one sentence on his first record that I, and you can back me up on this because you're a card carrying member of the black community, <laughs> and from the look of you, you look, you look black. Uh, yeah, I you, think you could draw that conclusion. So Eminem on his first album said, how can I be white if I don't exist? And I've been telling these guys for years, like that one sentence, if you're like a, a, a disenfranchised 
uh, black youth in the ghetto and you're not getting what other kids are getting, that one sentence spoke to all races because nobody felt right. like they existed. All of a sudden there was a white. It didn't matter. How can I be white if I don't exist? But did the black community, uh, you speaking, you're now the black community. I am the black community, community. Uh, did the basically. black community, when white rappers pop up, is there a pushback, just an initial thing like, hey, this is kind of our thing? Or if it's hot, is it just embraced and gobbled up like you were saying? Well, I think it, it depends on the black person in particular you're talking to. But for the majority, I think, well, well, let's look at the Beastie Boys, for example. I don't think anybody in hip-hop looked at the Beastie Boys as being a threat in that sense. The Beastie Boys, what they were doing and what they represented and that whole lifestyle had really, didn't really have a a black reflection, a a black, like, compliment to that. None. So they were kind of just doing what we felt crazy white boys did. Right. So it made for for black America that made all the sense because it kind of played into somewhat of a stereotype of what we expect white boys to act like, drink a bunch of beer, run around with the dicks out and shit like that, <laughs> right. crazy shit. Easy Emin- rhyme scheme, A-B, exactly. A-B, A-B, ABC. Now, Eminem was different because Eminem was act- actually very good at doing what up until that point most people had assumed only black people could be good at it. It was just a reverse of a of a black hockey player. Just like this guy's actually pretty good at this. Yeah. You know, I didn't I didn't know anybody black was gonna be good at or even care to be good at hockey. That's the same way I think we felt in hip hop. So now it becomes okay, now this guy's ne- not just a participant, he's active competition and he's actually high level competition. He right now and and then we're talking about the early days of Eminem, he's better than most MCs. What if he's better than all MCs? So, so that kind of an argument. If people have an issue about Eminem, that's as an if you're an artist, then it's probably more fear based than anything. You use a great word, threat. Now, the hip hop artist, do you? I know comics were competitive. I don't know if we're competitive as much as a guy uh, does a joke on stage and you go, God, I totally could have wrote that. You're jealous that you didn't come Absolutely. up with that. So, with hip hop, you use the word threat. A guy like Eminem comes out, and other hip hop, let's say guys like, I don't know, just rapper to be named at a later date, comes out, and you hear that beat, and it's just something a little bit different. Or like when Outkast came out, Andre 3000 was rapping completely different than anybody else. His rhymes, his rhyme schemes were completely off the charts. Jay Z, Hard Knock Life, first two verses, it didn't even rhyme. You know what I mean? He's using the theme from Annie for crying out loud. Yeah. So is there uh, – I see, this is important for me as a lover of hip-hop, for you, the ambassador, in my mind, of Southern hip-hop, to break this down for me. Uh, w- when guys come out with new flows and new styles, do you guys, do the Bun B's of the world and the Scarfaces and the Southern guy or, you know, hell, anybody in L.A. or New York, do you guys go, uh-oh, time to change it up because I'm listening. I know you wouldn't admit it. You're not right. going to say to your friends, like, wow, this guy's like just blew me off the map. But in your mind, when you're laying in bed at night, are you thinking, this guy, like Andre 3000, for example, change, like Eminem, are you thinking to yourself consciously, this guy just took the game to another level. Now I have to take the game to another level. How am I going to do it? Absolutely. Um, it's a good thing that you mentioned Andre 3000 because the last time I talked to him, and he ended up saying it again in an interview, we were talking about these new guys in the industry, and he was like, no matter how good we think we are, we're still rapping like we've always rapped. And all the new flows are coming from the new guys. So as much as we think we're inventing new flows and new styles, it's really just, it may be a little skewed, but it's still almost close to what you've kind of been doing. So when, when new things happen in new in hip-hop, it's usually from new people. Like who? Who's new that's changing the game right now? Because all you know what I hear? I hear auto-tune. I hear hooks, and then when the rhyme comes, I hear bullshit. I think um, you start with a guy like Kendrick Lamar yep. from Los Angeles. Um, the way he articulates himself is very new and distinct. Um, he also learned very early in the process. Well, I won't say early because he comes up under Dr. Dre, so that's probably the best tutelage you can get in <laughs> hip-hop. But um, he knows how to make his voice an instrument. He's really good at... Um, like, I don't, I don't want to make sure I say it correctly. He kind of has these sing-songy flows with his voice. So he'll, like, at the end of the line, like, stretch it out or really enunciate it or vocalize it in a way that you don't normally associate with that word and then continues to bend 
other words on that same basis, and it it's like another instrument in a song. It gives rising action. It add, The voice adds ebb and flow. So do you and Andre 3000 listen to that and go, well, that's what we got to do next, or do you just keep nah, sticking with what you know? You got to stick with what you know because you don't want to try to seem like you're trying to do what everybody else is doing. You get laughed out of the house. Just because, I, I Lamar, mean, right? I, I could write a rhyme like that and say my rhymes like that. But people would say you sound like Kendrick Lamar. Yeah, and what's that the good in that? That's Kendrick Lamar. That's not what people want to hear it's from It's like me. being a cover band. Basically. So... You know, he's definitely a guy that brings a new element to the table. I like Meek Mill. I think he brings a different energy and and Matty Boy sound. Likes Meek Mill a lot. Matty Boy and he's Meek got Mill. and he's a high pitched rapper, which we don't hear a lot in hip hop. Most hip hoppers try to yo, what's up, what's up, and try to deepen that shit and butch it up. But he's a guy. He's very secure in himself, so he he doesn't mind having that high pitched voice. And it's kind of like Big Sean too. He's got that voice. Kind yeah, of. About exactly. Quasimodo. What happened to Quasimodo? But you know, Big Sean is but Big Sean is like what maybe five six. Little Maybe dude. 110 pounds. Yeah. Meek Mill's like 6'2". Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So he's a sizable guy but still has that high-pitched voice. If You know, if you hear a high-pitched voice come out of Big Sean's vo- bo- uh, body, it's not surprising. Yeah. It's a little different when you hear it with Meek Mill. That, uh, that like, machine gun style rap now is is, is something that I think is, has changed a lot in the game. It's just that, that like, like twister that, and t- that twister, that Yellow Wolf stuff that's just... Uh, like that Mac Miller, all that stuff that that machine gun rap is a, is a big. Well, style it's about a, it's about ability. That just comes from guys wanting to really prove their lyrical abil- lyrical ability because that's not easy to it's not easy to write and it's it's even harder to to do. Yeah, you know I could do it, but, but can you do it live? Like KRS One, we're going to quote a lot of hip hop today, Bumby. A lot of KRS like One. KRS One said. If you can set it live, it's like being insured for life because people will always come back and see you twice. Abs- if absolutely. you're rapping that fast, like Twista, I I don't know if Twista can hit the stage live. Without hitting a pedal you, you, or something, can he can he do it live? Uh, yeah, he could do it live. Well, that's um, damn impressive. Then you and, know what? He's worth every penny he gets. Cause yeah, I couldn't but do it every, live. I but everybody breath. can. Yeah, you know, there's there's of course there's studio tricks for everything. There's a way of editing rhymes to make it seem like you're rhyming a bunch of words together when Would really you you're taking breaks. With KRS One, you got to set it live. Oh, without question. If you record a song and you can't repeat that song live. It defeats the purpose because it's that's just going to be bad for you. You know, I have a song that I'm famous for, uh, "Murder," and it's like very high speed, um, rapid fire lyricism. And people come to the shows now, and it's just there's a a, a a relief that they get from knowing that I can still perform that rhyme to this day with no trick. I didn't You're use an any old tricks ass to record. man. Shit. Yeah, I'm 40, man. That shit ain't easy. You know. No, believe me, I got out of breath just it. taking a piss just now. <laughs> This and and music and entertainment, you know, Jay, it's a young man's sport. Yeah, definitely. So you know, I got to work twice as hard to still be able to do shit that I was doing twenty years ago. Uh, quoting more rappers, let's go uh, complete OG. Uh, let's go uh, Biggie eating five cent gum, not knowing where your next meal is coming from. Is that how you grew up? Did you grow up broke, not knowing what the hell was going on and what your future was like? Yeah, I used to. Uh, we had a decent life when my parents uh, were together. My parents got divorced. How old Shit kind of hit the fan. Uh, I want to say maybe eight. That's tough. Nine years That's old. That's tough. But I had a lot of time with my dad, and uh, you know, Did I you was. Think it was your fault? No, not at all. I oh, knew okay. I knew my dad wasn't shit. Um, but yeah, for me, it, you know, I like when me and my mom were together for a while. We lived in a duplex. And a duplex is basically it's a house. That's split down the middle. It's like a wall. They just put a wall in the middle of the house. So you share the living room. You're sharing the dining room. You share the bathroom. The only thing you know, I mean, uh, you, 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 I mean, it's like basically you get half the living room, they get half. You get half, they get Sharing half. Sharing it with another family. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But you're not in the same space. You're in the same house, but there's just a wall in between those areas. But you share the bathroom. That's broke. You know, so it's like. I don't think I don't think most listeners to this podcast can imagine sharing a bathroom with another family. So I mean that is yeah. that's poor. Yeah, I mean you know we had, we had good times, we had bad times. So when you're growing up poor, are you dreaming uh, about being a hip hop artist? Do you want to be a football player? Like what what was your way out? Or at, here's a better question: You speak very highly of your mom. Did your mom raise you in a way that it didn't occur to you that you needed a way out because you had everything you needed? Or did you know this is no way to live? There has to be a better way, and I'm going to find it. And was hip-hop that gateway for you? My mom was very you know, concerned about education, and she related status in life was based on education. Um, my mom never went past 10th grade in high school at that point when I decided to start rapping and stuff like that. Um, in high school, my dad had never went to school past the sixth grade. Um, both of my parents are from deep rural Louisiana, 
Um, both of my grandparents were, I wouldn't say sharecroppers, but they basically had, they, they worked to feel like my mom picked cotton, like not in a slave sense, but in a poor, this is how we but helped. She literally to, picked yeah, cotton. Yeah, my mom literally picked cotton in, in a field. Sun, yeah. yeah, and had to, like, had to quit school to, to work in the field and help take care of the other kids because she was the oldest kid. My mom is the oldest of 13 kids, wow. and my dad is second, uh, I mean, third of, of, 12 kids. Damn. So. You sure you ain't Catholic? Positive. <laughs> positive. Uh, somebody should have been Catholic, though. I was going to say, you don't but, believe in birth control. <clears throat> did you Did you know you needed a way out, or did your mom uh, provide you with a life where everything was cool, and as long as we have each other, we're fine? Or did you know at a young age, this is bullshit, sharing a bathroom. Well, I'm going to hip-hop my way out of this. Most of the people in my family worked in the labor industry. So I realized that if this was the, the life, and don't get me wrong, it wasn't a sad life. I had a lot of family. Right. You know, with 11, you know, uncles and aunts on one side and 12 uncles and aunts on the other side. Each one of them has at least four kids. There's, I got a ton of family. So I'm, I'm surrounded by people that I love constantly. But I also recognize that this is a station in life that none of them can really escape because they don't have the educational skills so they're forced to work in the service industry and then the labor industry. So I had to I, I decided early that I did how not early? like work probably about probably 10 years old. Okay, so 10 um, years old you decide what? I don't want to I don't want to work outside. That's what I don't want to do for a living. Okay. Is work outside. My dad's boots smell like shit. <laughs> I got to fucking pick his corns with his knife every now and then. It's just I don't want that life for myself, you know? And I hate to see him do it. <laughs> I hate to see him work like that because I'm never seeing my dad because he's always fucking gone because he's he's working on the railroad and different kind of things. So for me, I was like, I just want to do something that generates money so that I don't have to live like this and my parents don't have to live like this. And then maybe my younger cousins will feel the same way and then they won't want to live like this because I'm seeing my older cousins become complacent in their in their station in life and not want more than that. And I realized that the this, that the one factor across all of them, you know, across the board with everybody was the lack of education. Okay. So for me, I was like, okay, I got to get you, get an education and get a really good job. Fell in love with hip hop and then shit started changing. Like, okay, I, there's possible, there's possibility that I can make a decent living, but you got to think this is an 89. No rappers are really rich. You know, some of them are making money. You got to through under that corporate umbrella mm -hmm. that we talked about earlier, and the corporation will just suck you dry. Suck them dry. Interesting. Everything. So you would see a couple of guys like Eric B. and Rakim on the car, on the Rolls Royce with the big chains. Like, okay, they're making some money. You know that's all saying? they had was the sweatsuit, the Kangol hat, and the gold chain. Well, you don't, that, but you car. don't know that yeah, yeah, when, yeah. when you're a kid. You know? So I'm like, okay, maybe that's, in a way, maybe that's a way to escape this as well. And that's closer to me than everything else. Like, I'm working hard in school. I'm making good grades, but my parents can't afford to send me to college, to like a good college, you know. So if I'm going to go, I got to get a scholarship. So then I get a scholarship uh, to go to Xavier University. What well, was you, you just with good grades? That was that was um, yeah that was academic. And then yeah. I had this. I was up for another Look at scholarship, you, man. At Amco, back with Amco, because Port Arthur, where I grew up at, is a refinery. Double A M C O, yeah. Amco? Isn't that a body parts place? That, well, is, that, is it Amco now? Amco. That's a body part. That's a refinery, too, right? Yeah. So you had a scholarship to go to work at it a refinery? To, yeah, like you go and get a degree. You, the, the I refinery, thought I was making a joke. This the, is real. Yeah, the refinery paid for you to go to college for four years for an, an engineering degree. Yeah. And then you get out and you immediately get a uh, 45000 a year job. Oh, and, uh, but that must I was, have been uh, a very appealing to a young Bun B. Yeah, but you know, I started, like, again, I fell in love with hip-hop. I really wanted to do that. And then the other kid that was up for the award was this kid, Jaime Castaneda. I'll never forget him because he, he was poorer than me. This kid grew up poorer than me. And I felt like, you know, I didn't, I, I didn't want to take this opportunity from him. So like I dropped out of it, he automatically what? got. Fuck it. that guy! Get your you could. But I had Xavier another dream, and, and then I but then I would have had to go to a different university, and I wouldn't have been able to do what it was I wanted to do. So I took a chance. I gave Jaime. I, Jaime gets the scholarship by default, and uh, I get with Pimp C and go for it. DollarShaveClub.com, best razor blades I've ever used. Back to Bun B in a second, but I got to tell you guys, DollarShaveClub.com. No more shelling out 20 bucks for a pack of blades. No more painful shaves with old, worn-out razors. 
Go to dollarshaveclub.com and enter the promo code J in dollarshaveclub.com. We'll immediately donate $10 to cancer research. Shave time, shave money, dollarshaveclub.com. Go to dollarshaveclub.com and enter the promo code J and help raise money. And let's beat it. So, and we're going to get to Pimp C in a second. Have you talking, have you spoken to him? I haven't say? talked to him or seen him. I, I wonder be, how that works. As Barry Katz would say, that guy should send you a fruit basket, basket, man. man. <laughs> uh, so you did not go to college. Yet. No, I ne- I didn't attend college. You did not attend college. Nope, and yet, I'm we're going to circle back. Uh, you are now a professor at Rice University. Check that out. Teaching what? Hip-hop and religion and hip-hop culture. Now, uh, religion and hip-hop culture, how on earth are those two tied together? Or is it two as, different classes? No, it's, it's as forms of expression in America. That's what religion is and that's what music is. So it's basically a class of freedom of speech. Basically. Oh, okay. Or or maybe not so much freedom of speech if you're Catholic. Because you kind of just got to go with the flow. No, there's a new Catholic church. I'm in the Well, there's a new pope. Yeah, you got a progressive pope cool. right now. And I go, look, think globally, act locally. I take a ton of shit from atheists and people like, you're a cafeteria Catholic. You're picking and choosing what you choose to believe. And I'm, like, fought, I'm like, yeah, I don't think Jonah lived in a whale. You got to be a nut to think that that actually happened. It, these are parables. These are stories. Right. And I'm lucky enough that I went to a church and I asked priests and uh, Monsignor Torgerson and Father Tim. And these grown men looked me in the eye and said, I don't know. I don't know. And it was like the biggest weight off my shoulders to have a man, uh, an authority figure, just admit, I don't know. Because our whole lives, right. it's like, you're going to need algebra the rest of your life. I'm not going to, unless I'm an algebra teacher, I'm not going to use fucking algebra. Don't lie to me. Just tell me, you're never going to need this shit, but you need it to get right. to college. And then I would have went, all right. But when you tell me I need, I had a good, you, I think we're very much alike. We had very good bullshit, bullshit detectors, detectors at a yes, very sir. young age. And I knew the algebra teacher was stuck in a rut and respect the algebra teachers. It's a tough hustle. Now, I love teachers, period. You got to give them credit. Educators, we easy. should call them and we give them the raises. Get these corporate yeah, guys, take uh, take money out of their pockets. Give I it see to it totally educators. different now being on the other side of the classroom. And it's I couldn't imagine five days a week at a fucking public school Ugh. with kids that, you know, half the kids don't even want to be there. Texting, writing on their desk. Saying, fuck you, like it's nothing. I'd I, get thrown out. I'd smack a kid It'd be in two a problem. Seconds. It'd be a problem. Was it Bernie? I'll fight a kid, Bernie. Bernie Mac. I'll mm, fight a kid. I'll fight a kid. So you teach at Rice University. You teach hip-hop. And uh, did they give you an honor- honorary degree? No, nah, no. Nah, you just, don't need one now. You're on, I, you're on the staff. Who, faculty. Who gives a shit about a degree? I yeah. get to eat in the teacher's lounge. I get a good parking spot. <laughs> who gives a shit? <laughs> it's weird when you get successful and you make, uh, you know, let's just call it what it is, when you're making a couple million dollars a year. It's amazing how the little stupid things to us make us so happy. When they gave me that ID <laughs> and that shit said faculty, it made my life. It made my life. I called my mom. I'm like, Mom, I teach it. Rice University is like, what do you teach? You didn't even go to, how can you teach? <laughs> I'm like, it's a new day, mom. You ain't got to go through that shit no more. Now, Just- how do you go, how do you uh, game plan? I guess school, I guess it's game plan. How do you do your curriculum? Do you set it up for the whole year? Yeah, it's all laid out for the year. And do you Because tell we bring in one? different, yeah, they get everything day one. Because every now and then we'll bring in different guests. So we have to schedule all that kind of shit early. So I'll bring in different people in hip hop that have interesting religious backgrounds. Mm-hmm. To share their their following, and you do bring in religious story. leaders from around the uh, uh, the town. We we've done it before. Um, it it gets tricky, you know, being on a on a oh, university so. campus. Like I brought in a a, a local Muslim leader, Quano X, who had had issues with the local uh, Jewish league. Um, he was a Holocaust denier for a while. Finally gave him a tour that of the museum. That always goes over well, right? They finally gave him a Jeez. tour of the museum. You know he you know, re- retracted his statements. Oh, okay. So they were concerned about having him on the campus because it was a uh, big fundraising year. It was like the 100th anniversary of the university, a big fundraising Ice year. Ice-T, freedom of speech, just so, like what you said. But, I mean, he's, uh, you know, you just got to know how to direct the conversation and let guys understand that this is not about them, it's about the kids. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, he came in and gave, an, you know, an incredible experience because he's not only, like, uh, a religious leader, but he was also with Scarface. And his, his brother and Scarface were best friends, and his brother got killed, like, at a very pivotal point of Scarface's career. So in the hip-hop community, and that's when he gave his life over to Islam. After his brother got killed, he's like, I'm done with the streets, and I'm done with all of this. I've got to try to change the streets. So everybody in the hip-hop community knows him and knows that he was there, and now he's here. What know? percentage of rappers actually carry a gun and use it? Because and every use rap- it? Oh, because <sighs> every rapper, I'm rounding up. Right. I would say 85% of rappers are just talking about the gat, 
and I got the AK, the street sweeper in the trunk, a, a split your wig and all right. that shit. But how many of these rappers actually are carrying guns and have pulled them on people in their everyday lives? And how much of it is just show business? Uh, pulling a, pulling out a gun is show business. Using it is when it changes <laughs> to reality. Yeah. But there's a lot of guys that Don't are carrying guns. Don't pull the bang on unless I'm, you plan a bang. I'm trying to tell you. Um, not many. Not many. And we all in hip-hop know who's who. Like, the people may not know, but within the community and the artists, we know who's who's who. There's certain guys where you're like, yeah, you don't, don't just... Yeah, like, it ain't it's, gonna end well for it's you. not even that... This it ain't music, gonna be a fist fight. There's a couple of people that we know this music game is not that serious to them. <laughs> so don't, don't think that you're gonna get the, quote, industry reaction. If you play with this guy or that guy, you're gonna get a very real reaction. He's not going to like go in the studio and make a song about you and tweet threats and stuff like that. This like guy's LL gonna actually, trying to blow up cannabis. Yeah, no, this guy's going to actually approach you at some point in a very derogatory manner. And put a gun in your mouth. Well, that, that happens. That happens in hip-hop more than people know. You mentioned- guys don't make songs about when the gun gets put in their mouth. They tend to make <laughs> songs about putting the gun in their mouth. You know what? That would be a very brave album if you did a whole time, a whole rap about the time you were at Ralph's. Right. And so and so came around the corner and put the barrel at a thirty eight yeah, in your mouth and you shit your pants. Pistol whipped you in front of McDonald's. I got beat you don't like a that. bitch in aisle four. No, you don't. <laughs> no. That doesn't make it in the top eight at eight, usually. You mentioned your guy Pimp C. Uh rest in peace, of course. Uh Pimp yes, C sir. UGK, uh OG crew for you. Now, Pimp C, uh he uh very different path. As you. Yeah. You uh, knew you didn't want to work outside. You knew you wanted to get an education. You were up for a, 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 a scholarship. Um, now you're on a faculty. Pimp C sort of went in a complete opposite direction. You guys, it seems like it's strange bedfellows that a guy as educated and as smart as you would hook, hook up with a guy. Is it safe to say Pimp C was a bit of a loose cannon? Um, yeah, I mean, he, he, he was just very passionate, I think, is the, is the term I like to use with him. It wasn't like he would just you know, run up and just start smacking people or whatever. But he was very passionate about what he believed in. All right, and well, he hold, hold on a second. Going to jail and then dying, that kind of goes past passion. Well, yeah, it's not like he died. It's not like he died like somebody killed him in a violent confrontation or anything. Well, why don't you tell the listeners how he died? Yeah, he died in his sleep. He had sleep apnea. Yeah. And uh, partnering that with, you know, doing drugs or whatever, it doesn't really, doesn't really add up. That's like I'm saying. That's... So. that's now, no. going to prison, yeah, that, that might be a little past passion for sure. Now, what did Pimp C go to prison for? Pimp C went to prison for violating his probation for pulling out a gun in a mall. Brandishment is a felony. Yes. Now, this has been bugging me from day one since I knew anything about uh, the law, about hip-hop, about communities. It seems like, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but okay. we're just this is real talk. Every time a famous black person gets arrested, the next day the T-shirts are out. Free Pimp C. Right. Free James Brown. James Brown drove across six states and <laughs> shot a fucking 12-gauge <laughs> shotgun at police car. What? Free Mamiya. Free Mamiya shot a goddamn police officer. Pimp C had brandishment, committed a felony, violated right. his parole. Why the fuck should I free Pimp C? Because I miss him. I know you miss him, but I'm saying at the time <laughs> when he was still alive, there's well, so a many, lot of people missed him. But there's a lot of people that are in jail for 15 years for dealing pot at a Grateful Dead concert. You know, you never see what is. How come? Why don't white people rally like, "Hey, free the guy that sold LSD sandwiches at the Fish concert"? You never see that T-shirt. It's always the black community like, "Hey, man, this is an outrage. You got to yeah. free Mamiya. But free Mamiya shot a cop. Why am I? Why am I letting him? Allegedly. Lose? So we could get into that. Let's not get into that. Well, but no, I just oh, excuse me. According to the judge's gavel, ain't nothing alleged about it. <laughs> Motherfuckers, He's guilty. guilty. Yeah, two at a time. Guilty. Uh, what is it? Why? Why free this? Free that? What is it? It's camaraderie. It's more than anything. But it's- shouldn't the camaraderie be for the people like yourself that are living their lives the correct way? getting faculty passes and going about life the right way, getting an education, selling records. No one works harder than you. I see your tweets. I see the the parties you're putting on and the albums you're putting out and the amount of work you put into your studio albums and the live shows and the amount of times you travel and the crew you roll with, a very small crew. You don't come in with a crazy entourage. Shouldn't you be the guys that are celebrated? Shouldn't it be like, you know, support Bun B would be a way cooler T-shirt then free uh, insert name guy here that could, 
Yeah. But it's already support. By wearing that T-shirt, you support me because that's the movement that I'm pushing. So if you want to support me, you wear the Free Pimp C T-shirt. I'm not saying it's right. Why doesn't Pimp not C saying, just not violate his probation? That would be a great thing, too. Yo, then we how don't about have to that? do the T-shirt. Don't, how about a T-shirt, don't violate your probation? Maybe, wouldn't that, wouldn't maybe, that be better for the black community if, if I had thought to make that the white t- community? If I had thought to make that T-shirt <laughs> before he committed the crime, yeah. then maybe that. You know, But you know, we wear T-shirts and, that say... Don't do the crime if you can't do the time. Right. The guys still do the crime. And it's speaking as a white representative at the table. Okay, because you're the white community. Now, I'm the black community. You're right the white now, community. And Maddie's right, right here. down the middle I'll over I'll be there. the stoner community. Here's, I, I'll give you that. I, I, I think the, the, the pushback is it, it's, it's almost like, um, I don't know how to, I should have thought this through before I went down this, uh, down this right. path. White America, I think, looks at these t-shirts and it makes him sick because it looks like the promotion of a criminal no you're freeing a guy a guy james brown so you're guy. saying basically this guy was convicted the, the judge said commit him james brown if that's how he's acting he shot a 12 gauge shotgun at a police it, car it, and it, went through a six state police chase i can't wear a free james brown t-shirt why not i just can't wear it because miss- because I don't care if James Brown's free or that. All right. That, but Pimp C is your friend, so we got to take him off the right, table. Right, right. So that, that's my thing. That's just a personal thing that turned into a cultural thing. You know, just because I'm wearing a free Pimp C t-shirt, that's just how I feel. How about support Pimp C? Wouldn't that be a more accurate message? Support him while he's in prison? Yeah. Well, I mean, no. I mean, we want him he's out. He's going to get out. Look, these little gestures, Jay, even if they, we already, I can wear a million free Pimp C t-shirts. Parole board's got all the say in that. I can wear as many t-shirts as I want, and people can wear as many t-shirts as they want. It has no impact when it comes, when he's got to stand in front of the parole board. None. So it's really just about just letting guys that are inside, because no one's more forgotten about in America than the, than the, the imprisoned. And everybody that's in prison isn't necessarily guilty. Most of them are. Yeah. But there's a couple. You got a couple of guys in there that you know got a bad shake. You know, like yeah. hey, this is a crime that most guys usually only get 12 months for. You got five years. That's a fucking shame. You know, Pimp C's first crime. He should have gotten probation when what he was did his first got crime? it. I mean, that was his first crime. The brand he should have got. Yeah, he got probation. Then he violated. Okay. So that was on him. The first, you know, the first time they 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 did what they were supposed to do. You didn't do what you were supposed to do. But then Pimp C is more than just. My brother and my partner, you know, he was a mentor to a lot of people. He was a big brother to a lot of people. He consulted a lot of people on their projects. He wasn't just a recording artist. He was a great producer. He sang for people on different projects. And his tutelage and his wisdom was something that couldn't be replaced. And we see that now that he's gone. Like, there's nobody that can even come close to taking his place. And that's kind of what it was like. You know, you don't really appreciate something or someone until you don't have them around. And that's just how the South felt. Like, you know, this is one of our best spokesmen. This is one of the guys that keeps it real, that doesn't care about money or position. It just really speaks from the heart. And now we don't have him here. And none of you other fucks are willing to take his place or even try to be half the man he was. No, he was he perfect? No, but who is, you know? And uh, How did you guys meet? How do you meet Pimp C? Pimp C and I had a mutual friend. And uh, basically, I didn't like him. I didn't like Pimp C. And he didn't like me. But that's because we didn't really know each other. So we had already assumed who the other guy was. And then finally, like, we had a confrontation at a football game. Like, he tried to call me out on some shit. As he thought I was faking about a lot of shit for some reason. And In your rhymes? It. Faking what you wanted? No, no. About? I'd actually, I was always an older looking kid. I've looked like how I look right now since I was about 14. Yeah, like the like father for the club. Full beard, everybody. I'm the guy that bought liquor for everybody. I'm the guy that got to sneak in the clubs and all that shit. So I would come to Houston to a club called Rhinestone Wrangler with some of my older cousins. I would be able to get in the club, and then I would see all these different rappers, and I'd come back and be like, yeah, so-and-so was in the club last night. This guy and that guy was in the club or whatever. So um, one night, Eazy e and, and uh, DOC and all these guys are in the club, and they're taking, like, the club's taking a gang of the Polaroid pictures up against the backdrop in the club and shit. So while the guy, like, he'll take a picture, he'll put it down, take another picture, put it down. So I swiped one of the pictures yeah. that day. So we went to the football game that weekend. I was like, yeah, man, EZ was in the club. I just saw those guys in the club this weekend. Pipsy, like, you're a goddamn lie. I'm sick of this shit. You're always coming around here lying about shit. You don't know these fucking people. You ain't see that shit. You was right here at home just like everybody else. And I pull out the picture. He's like, oh, shit. <laughs> You really were in that motherfucker. You know what I'm saying? And then after that, we were like the best of friends from that point on. Now, how quickly after you guys became friends did you decide to go into the studio and collaborate? Well, he was already making music. 
Pimp C was actually making music maybe two years before I was. But Pimp C had the wherewithal to know you would be an asset to Pimp C. Right, right. Well, I, I, when I first started, I wanted to be a battle rapper, so I was competitive with everybody. So I competed with all the guys until I had the best reputation in town. And then it would be obvious that they would have to include me because at that point I was the best rapper in town. Pimp C was the best producer in town. So it was my goal to get their attention, to get that crew's attention. So I got their attention, got in there, and then when it came time to move from being a pastime to actually wanting to have this as a career, Pimp C and I were really the only guys that were really committed to giving up everything. Like I was like, fuck college, fuck scholarship, all that shit. I want to rap. I didn't really know that you could do both at the time. I was under the under, under the understanding personally that you got to pick one or the other, and I chose music. Tell me the names of crews or guys that you know you've obliterated in a battle rap, and they can't even take a mic anymore because you just put them out of business. Oh, a lot of these guys I went to school with, um, guys like Sylvester Vitar, uh, Randy Johnson, guys who I were in the same crew with, but there was just no competition with me. The only guy that ever— um, Anybody the listeners heard of that they're like, oh, that's right. Bun um, B just devastated that guy. Uh, no. Because it seems like battle well, rap is the battle, lost well, battle art. Battle rapping is, well, that was before I was even signed, so this is more like young street guys. So that's how you get, going back to respect on the block, yeah. the fact that Pimp C, I don't know if the listener knows this, but hip-hop, it, it was all about house parties, and you know this. It used right. to be the DJ was the star. The DJ was always the star. And the he rapper the was the side guy. It was almost like uh, like he was just an afterthought. It was, it was Eric B., and then there was Rock Kim. The, it was DJ Jazzy Jeff, and, and it was the, the Fresh, Fresh Prince. Prince. The, the DJ was the guy, and the rapper was the guy to fill time while the DJ went and got a drink, and got a smoke, and got a blowjob, and, ca- and came back. But then all of a sudden, the house parties evolve. And in East Coast, uh, I'm not telling you this. I'm telling the listener, obviously. You know all this shit. But in the East Coast, I don't know when it started. I don't know the exact timeline. But it started to go, guys started to get more famous than the DJ because other guys want to be the guy, and correct me if I'm wrong, this is my understanding of it. Okay. Other guys wanted to be the guy to fill the time at the house party between the DJ setup. And the only way to earn that time was it to explain to the people at the house party why I'm better than you and why I should be up here instead of you. Battle rap, hip hop started. Because of battle rap. Is that a fair yeah, assessment? Yeah, it's, pretty, it, it's built on braggadocio. Right. The entire culture is built on, I'm better at this than you. Right, but we've gotten completely away from that in hip-hop. Now it's bitches, hoes, yachts, money. Look what I got him at the club. I'm making it rain. Because everybody wants to be that rock star. They all want to be that rock star. But it seems like there's this like Queens, Brooklyn, Bronx, that like East Coast specifically... And yes, I'm East Coast biased, but I give mad love to the West Coast. It seems like East Coast specifically is just holding on for dear life, just trying to hold on to that battle rap, but no one's answering. Like if LL grabs a mic, if Nas grabs a mic, and KRS, to bring him up again, uh, grabs a mic, and those East Coast guys grab a mic, it, they're taking someone out, but wh- whether the, the other person signed up for it or not. Right. It's all about accessibility. In the early days, hip-hop was not as accessible as it is now. So the time was very small and limited. So people were fighting for that opportunity. Because, you know, you go you listen at the radio. Hip-hop maybe played for an hour at 2 in the morning when hip-hop first started. So it wasn't, we didn't have stations that just played rap music all day. Even the clubs at the parties, they didn't play rap all the time during the party. A lot of the breakbeats that they played were from disco records and R&B records. Right. So... It was really just about fighting for those few minutes when they allowed guys on a microphone to actually be a part of the process. So that's where the initial battle between MCs came from, like you're saying, to fight to be the guy that gets to be on the mic at the house party when they do that. Because that, that was always just a very short segment. As the competition became more and more, people became interested because there weren't a lot of rappers initially. So as you get more and more people who can actually rap, People are interested in seeing, okay, well, who's better? Because initially it's just, okay, well, that's a rapper, that's a rapper, that's a rapper, and the rest of us are all listeners. And then all of a sudden, here comes two more guys. Here comes four more guys. Here comes a group of three. So now we have more hip-hop. Well, you look at 2013, and every fucking body's a rapper. Every fucking... But no a, one's battle rapping. No, no. It's because, auto-tuned. Because the access, it's hooks. Because it's, it's, because it's accessible. So there's no need for competition. If you're a rapper, you can make a song and release it, and, you, and it's out there. You don't have to compete to somebody for somebody to be heard anymore. Right. 
with YouTube, with also, iTunes. Also, you're saying battle rap that. was a necessity. Absolutely. In order to put yourself over you the You couldn't top. just say, I'm a rapper, let me rock the party. No, you had to prove yourself in order to be able to rock a house Like, party. hey, thanks, Matty Boy. Uh, glad you had your two minutes of fame, but now I'm going to get on the mic and bury Matty Boy at the party. And so the next Matty time Boy we're at the party. Never, Matty Boy will never be allowed to get on the mic again. Unless he comes back next week and destroys me. If, if we even give him a chance to get up there. Because now we have more and more people that want to compete. But that back and forth still happens. I mean, you know, today. It's, it's, I coming, mean, it's coming back now. You know what I'm saying? And it is in New York, you know, where a lot of these guys Jada, are these Jada, battle, 50, rap leagues and all stuff, that stuff like that. There's always going to be competition in hip-hop. But it always seems very veiled the now. The, the battle raps now, it's always, like, alluded to. It's very veiled. It's not like back. It's not like Roxanne, Shantae, and those guys. When no, they were just no. straight saying, your crew fucking sucks. And this is where hip hop is from, and where you live is bullshit. Right. And get LL off crack, or you guys fucking suck. And uh, easy, and, and there was no money. That's the other right. thing, Jay. In the early days, there was no money. But I'll give West Coast credit. Easy E, when he decided to step up and take out Dre and Snoop, holy shit! And you want to talk about guys that were paid in full? The whole right. NWA crew, Easy just took Dre and Snoop, and somehow. Dre and Snoop came out of that unscathed. Why is that? Because Easy E, when he decided to put uh, Dre and Snoop in his sights, he was very specific. He was talking about Snoop, very specific about negatives about Snoop. Absolutely. He called Dre gay, uh, gay called him a yep. faggot, said, if you don't believe me, look at this photo on this record. The motherfucker's wearing lipstick. I swear, He said, I swear on my mother that this shit is true. Like, Easy laid it all out. These guys just... They just walked. They didn't even have to respond. Yeah. Why, why, why wasn't there traction on the West Coast with the D- battle raps? DJ K-Slave made a, a good point. DJ K-Slave, K-Slave. He, he explained to me, he said, when, you guys, when guys make diss records, the winner is always, it's not going to be the guy who talks the better shit. The winner is usually going to be the guy with the better beat because a diss record goes farther if you can play it in the clubs and people can dance to it. So the Easy E record might have had more potent slugs in it, but that Dre Day record was just a fucking great record to dance to. It's still <laughs> a great record, you know, and, and that that was the edge. The fact that Dre and Snoop make better music, we don't give a shit. Look at Rick Ross. Everybody who had this big thing against Rick Ross because he was a correctional officer, and he, you know, they were like, he, you were police, and Fifty Cent was like, I'm gonna take him out. He and shit, he was police. But at the end of the day, Rick Ross made better music, and people were like, you know what? I don't give a shit if he was a cop or not. I just want to dance to the best song I can dance to. This guy makes better dance records. Ruff. That's who I'm going with, and that's why Dre and Snoop kind of made it through all of that because they make better records. I live beat to beat like you live check to check. So unless yeah. you move your feet, I guess we like neck and neck. You hear this kid? And Rick Ross. Made I know. The beats. I know. Adrian's loving that. A- A- Rick Ross made the beats that make you move your feet. Man, that's uh, crazy. Who, uh, Matty Boy? You want to chime in here? What? You just leaned in Maddie's like you wanted high. to say he's, something. He's high. Maddie's I'm all stunned. Who do you think? Who do you think the best producer in the game right now is? That's a great question. Um, Ooh, Matty Boy, props. Matty Boy's not still, stoned, uh, by the way. Mike, we're no, talking about new producers or just producers in general. No, they're still new. Now, let's say I'm a rapper, mm-hmm. and I go, "All right," and you love my rhymes. I blow your fucking mind with the shit I'm spitting out, mm-hmm. and you go, "Okay," the, uh, to, for this to be fully, fully, fully done the right way. He's got to go get produced by blank. Oh, wow. Is that correct, um, Matty? Mike Will made it. I mean, now? Uh, Mike Will does I mean, he's the hottest, stuff. right? Um, he's probably getting the most work. Yeah. And his beats are, I mean, he's he's making great music. Beat Billionaire makes good music. Um, damn, that's a good question. Alchemist? Well, it, like, it, depends. it depends on what kind of artist we're talking about. If we're looking for maybe more commercial success, um, a sound that, the more more people are going to recognize, and probably probably Mike Will has the sound that most people recognize as far as across the board with hip-hop. That's interesting, right though. I, I think the listener finds that interesting, too. The fact that you said if you're talking about commercial success, right? The, I didn't know there was a line of delineation between keeping it real, keeping it underground, and, and, and keeping well, the street cred as opposed to moving units. Yeah, it, it depends on who you want to be, how you want to be looked at. And Can't who. you take one of those underground you know, street cred guys... And just pull them out. Like, you know guys 
that are in the clubs that aren't under the corporate umbrella. Right. And can't you hook them up with one of those producers and pull them out by the bootstraps and make them millionaires? Aren't you in the millionaire making business at you, this point? You can. You uh, personally. Well, yeah, I am definitely trying to make millions. I mean, who isn't? You can to a certain extent, but, uh, you know, it comes down to are these guys willing to be, you know, mentor you know it's just like you know if you have a great athlete you know he's a great athlete he's got great talent is he willing to be coached and then you got to get that guy in front of a good coach and there's people like swiss beats people like dj premier you know guys like alchemist yo primo who, but who, are, who are great producers but also smart people you know who can tell you okay you need to do this don't do that don't fuck with these guys. You need to fuck with these guys. I think a good example a little of more direction. I think a good example of that is the game. I mean, when you listen to his early stuff, he sounded so different than once he got together with Dre. Once Dre started, uh, you know, taking him under his wing, it, his voice sounded different. He changed his rap style, and and you know, and he got hot, and, and all his commercial stuff took off. And we don't have that anymore in hip hop. Hip hop used to, the majority of music record labels in hip hop used to be owned by individuals. Def Jam used to be owned by Rick Rubin and Russell Simmons. You know, and you know, they would take the time to nurture an artist. And hip-hop doesn't do that anymore. Most record companies are, you know, they're part of the umbrella now. So it's like, you know, they don't care if this kid is good. He just needs a little bit of time. Fuck that. How much money do we give him? How much money have we made back? Right. Fuck that. Put the album out next month. If it does numbers, we'll keep him. If not, get him out of here. There's but no in Houston, this isn't happening. No, no, because we, t- we were taking time to nurture before we even get into the mainstream. Right. So that this kid has an understanding of how the business works. Um, and they're bringing things to the table when they go in the meeting. That's where these whole new 360 degree um, deals come from. In the music industry, they're offering more, that more mean, artists 360 a 360 deal. That means that they not only want to sign you to a recording deal, but then they also want a piece of the concerts. They want a piece of the merchandise. It's like representing a boy band. Basically. They want a piece of everything. And I'm being serious. I'm not no, being no, joke. absolutely. The record company wants a piece of everything because they understand that artists are now brands. and they're Why haven't out record labels swooped down into Houston and just cherry pick guys like Bun B and your crew? Well, most of these guys don't need, rec- don't need them. So it's like if they're going to sign, they got to pay them an exorbitant amount of money, or else we're not even going to do it because we don't we don't so need Sony, the system. Sony doesn't ever get in touch with Bum B. They don't see the units you move and realize, wow, this guy he, he teaches at Rice. This is a great story. We can make a lot of money. They, it, they don't. They don't. You don't get those calls once in a while. You, you may get that call from a guy, you know, further down in the system. But then when they run that thing up to the powers that be, there's got to be numbers to, to to behind it right. to make those guys go. Because if they you don't, they, be don't to... they don't see. Street vibe. They don't, you know. What I'm you got to be able to play it between Taylor Swift and Katy Perry. Absolutely. Are they not going to touch it? Like, how many spins are we going to get from this thing? Greatest battle rap. Who, in your opinion, in the history of hip hop, absolutely just took a motherfucker out? Give me like two or three. Well, number one battle rapper I've ever seen lives here in Houston. His name's K Reno. He's one of K Reno. K Reno. Okay. He's one of our, you know. Oldest and dearest MCs. He is the OG to every OG here. Well, who did he take out? Everybody. At one point in time. Well, what part of the record store do I look up everybody? Where do I buy everybody album? <laughs> Just go to hip hop and look from A to Z. From the early 80s to yeah, probably like 83 to. So K Reno, Houston Zone, best battle rapper you've ever seen. I've ever seen. Mainstream, people that the listeners know. Eminem. Who, Eminem. Eminem. Who Big, did he take out? Big L. Eminem. Who did Eminem, Eminem take out? Uh. Well, nobody's taking out. It's not like you're going to hear a story where that guy took out this guy. That doesn't even – rappers don't put themselves in that kind of position anymore. The last great rap battle between two MCs might have been Freeway and Cassidy, two Philly rappers mm-hmm. that went at it in the early 2000s. But a lot of that stuff, none of that shit's LL on the record. and Cannabis went after it for a while, but Cannabis came right. That's not considered battle rap. And when we talk about battle rap, we're not talking about competing records. When we talk about battle rap, we mean two MCs standing in front of each other in a room oh, okay. fucking rapping against each okay. other. That is, okay, you're correct. Okay. I mean more a guy. But you mean a guy that with that aggressive out style? Out of 15 tracks, and one track is all about, oh, and by the way, this guy fucking sucks. And there's no reason you should ever buy his album, like how LL did the cannabis. That doesn't happen anymore. Well, Kendrick Lamar took a shot at, 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 at Slick Rick and uh, PM Dawn. They're done. Right. So, like, in your mind, it, are there guys that are mainstream that have taken the time? Because it's got to be exhausting, well, too. you got to really hate somebody. Because you know how long it takes in the studio, and I don't. Yeah, no, it takes a lot of energy. So yeah. the fact that you're spending a track 
just to take just to let every single person that listens to the units you move know that I fucking hate cannabis. He's from Canada. He gets his rhymes off the internet. <laughs> his mom sucks. Like th- he tried probably his- fifty. If we're going there, then maybe fifty. And who did he take out? Fifty and Jada, Jada right? Out, Jada oh, that's Rule. right. Oh yeah, yeah. He they had the Jada. sketches he didn't about really Jada. Take out Jada because Jada still got no. Nah, J- I think Eddie Jada killed with. him. Jada killed him. And uh, you think Jada beat fifty? But they had a whole sketch yeah. making fun of Jada. Well, Jada's always been a. a he's better. a crazy lyricist. Obviously, way better than fifty, in my opinion. Yeah, he's he's a much better lyricist. But then it's not always about lyrics because if a guy can, if a guy can just cut you. You know what I'm saying? Just say words that can really just cut you to the core. We call him 40 Cent now because he dropped the dime. <laughs> that's, that's pretty badass. That's man. pretty badass. That was a good one. Yeah, Jada did fuck. That, that was that crazy. Was, that was a good one. But, then, uh, you know, it's, it's 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 just, it's different, you know. It, it, you have a couple of guys that, that take shots or whatever, but most guys don't. You don't want to give up that kind of a time. Like you said, you got to really hate somebody to take the time to give them a piece of your album. Yeah, I give him a piece of my foot before I give him a piece of my album. <laughs> so I'm from the I'm from the you know the old school. Where if you got to beef with somebody, you try to see him. Like I always tell people, if you diss me, I'm gonna diss you back, but probably not till after the fight, because <laughs> I'm gonna come looking for you and I'm gonna see you. And then somebody's got to kick somebody's ass. I'll bring the camera. If I lose, you can keep the footage. I don't give a shit. <laughs> World star hip hop. World star. Because you got to fight. World star. You know, I was just, you know, like with this Richie Incognito thing. Like, I could understand guys being scared of him, whatever. But sometimes you got to get your ass kicked. Like, sometimes you just got to take that ass whooping. Like, for me, if it would have been me, I'd have I'd arrived at work at 8 o'clock every morning. And me and Richie would be fighting at 8.01 every fucking morning. I'm going to fight you every fucking day. Just until you just yeah. get tired of fighting. You're just going to get tired of kicking my ass. Because you but, <laughs> Because you got to you gotta be, you know, it's not about losing. A, you know, Stephen A. said this the other day, too. It was a good point. He was like, it's not about losing the fight. It's about what you're willing to lose for. Like, if you're going to get jumped by six or seven guys, that's not worth losing a fight. You get no points. Nobody's going to think you're brave for trying to take on eight guys and getting your ass kicked. But if you're standing in front of a guy, you know this guy's probably going to kick your ass. But, you you know, you need to stand on this principle. You're standing right. on and You know, this guy just called your wife a bitch. I don't care how big you are. You're just going to have to kick my ass in front of my wife. But I'm going to defend her honor. I may lose to you, but I'll win with her. You don't think your wife's going to break your balls at home when you're like, my wife's I'm tired of talking me, about this shit. My wife's going to give me the business when I get home. <laughs> oh, ten, uh, what's but, that? but, you know, it, it's rather her man can't fight than won't fight. Is it David Allen, I think. Is it David Allen Greer's joke? Oh, tonight you a man? <laughs> <laughs> I, forget, I think it's him. Love Dag. Uh, the big elephant in the room in hip-hop, and it's something that doesn't get enough media attention. You always see they, they exploit it. It's this tabloid culture we live in with Biggie and Tupac and the East Coast, West Coast, and both guys gunned down. No suspects. Video footage of uh, Tupac just stomping a guy's ass in a fucking casino. Right. Just no one knows what happened. Suge Knight in the car with uh, Tupac. Not a mark on him. Everything's sitting right next to each other. More conspiracy theories than JFK with these guys. More. And and Biggie uh, as well getting gunned down. Does the hip-hop community, now I'm not asking you to name names if you want to. That'd be so, fucking... so I'm not the black community anymore. I'm the hip-hop community. Well, you're all communities, brother. You you bridge all. You 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 you're the bridge across I'm Joe all. I'm McHale. I'm community. Your your, your bridges across all rivers. Uh, does the hip hop community have ideas? Not conspiracy ideas, but guys in the know, men of knowledge like yourself. Do you do you go? Well, yeah, we know who did it. Yeah, we. I mean, we kind of have a pretty good idea of who did these things. Who? But most guys, I'm not going to say it. On, on <laughs> Why not? Right now. Why say it? I don't gain anything from it because everybody knows. Yeah, but I do. <laughs> I could, I could show you the, I could show you, uh, you know, based on the best news reports of who did what. You know, and when 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 cops and journalists get together and they get to talking to the right people, they kind of get a sense of it. Why doesn't LAPD? Why, why isn't it more investigated? I know the knee jerk response is because it's it's a black guy. You know, right. it's a black guy, we don't care, or his ice cube. Just another nigga dead. Like, it's just, that's it, we don't care. Who gives a fuck? It's just right. some dirtbag rapper. That, some, why why some, should we investigate that? I always felt that? complacency. I always felt like there's a bit of complacency, and in order to, you know, we expose that, then you got to expose a lot of other things, and LAPD comes crumbling down. You think LAPD covered up anything in these sh- in these shootings? Or, I, think, or I think Las Vegas I PD? I think LAPD officers, I wouldn't say that the department, that there was like a, concerted effort by the Los Angeles Police Department to cover it up, but I think that 
I think there's some a bit of complacency, and I think there's like a bigger thing at scale. You know how they have these ongoing investigations where it's like we know what happened, and you know there was a cop there, but the cop can't say anything or anybody can't say anything because then they blow their cover. I think it's got a little what bit. What cover? Of what what cover are they blowing though? The cop. Well, you know, well, like the the cops blowing his cover. Like I believe that even today, in 2013, that there are people working with government agencies presently inside the hip hop community masquerading as promoters and maybe even possibly in certain cases producers or artists to uh, to what gain to what to what to end? just get to the point to see if these guys are really doing what they say they do oh to you see can't if just that, run, to you s- can't just run around talking about I sell them millions of dollars in drugs and I shoot and kill people and not think oh, that okay. somebody's going to want to maybe do a little research is you know cause Scott, who's going to have these you know hundreds every you got hundreds of guys talking about I'm gangster I'm hard I I pack my pistol I pull my pistol I shoot my pistol and you know and, and then I've got all these different uns, unsolved crimes and murders in my city what if one of you fucking guys did it right. you know there's that story too I think it was uh, X rated you know the rapper from yeah. uh, he got he got uh, locked up for for uh, rhyming about a murder he committed and and they got him on the charges, right? Isn't that right? Yeah, yeah. Actually, well, he was pretty much an idiot. I mean, he I mean, he put it on an album. He said like, you know, he he gave specific details to a crime that he committed. I think it was a murder. And, guys have uh, done that about bank robberies. Guys are on YouTube now. And then they get caught making, up making videos talking about they sell dope, and then they shoot the video and they show the dope. Like, who do you? What do you? In what world do you think that that kind of shit just blows over? That police don't care. I'll or tell that you. What everybody's world. or that everybody's going to assume. That you're making real statements, but you're only showing fake drugs. But I'll tell you the world. The world you grew up in. That duplex house where you shared a bathroom, you shared a, a common room, and you grew up dirt poor, and your, 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 your whole family was literally picking cotton 15 hours a day. That world. Yeah. Those guys. And that mentality that never leaves that. that, that that's the world. Those guys, they, they're not like yourself. Your mother drove you to get an education. Right. And you, you knew you wanted a way out, and you knew the way you wanted to get out. But and those I know, guys... I know a lot of guys that didn't have anybody that even wanted them to be better. Right. Like somebody consciously, you know, made an effort to make me feel, but then also to reinforce with words that I want you to do better. Right. I know a lot of guys who grew up in houses who are literally like, you ain't going to be shit. You're not going to be shit. And you know why they say that? Because if they do get better, then they'll be left alone. Right. Sitting in their own shit. They want you to be be miserable and stuck here with me. Because if you leave, then I'm alone shitty. Yeah. You know what I mean? If you better yourself and move on, then I'm just alone shitty. Because I'm not finna better myself. I ain't shit. I don't want to be anything. You you've done so much uh, as a rapper. What's left on the table? Do you want to get into movies? Uh, I've done a couple of things. I did a couple of independent films. Um, Maybe I don't know. I don't know if they're looking for any forty-year-old fat balding black people in Hollywood. I don't know if there's a deficit of that. Um, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm sure Ving Rhames is getting s- all those ro- getting all those roles. You want to hear a great Ving Rhames story? I would love to hear a great. Man, Ving you Rhames f- story. I don't know if I've ever told this on the podcast, Maddie. I was doing uh, Oscar De La Hoya's Night of Champions, and uh, I'm backstage. I'm presenting an award, and I'm supposed to uh, present with Rafer Johnson, the Olympian. Uh, and uh, just as cl- no one's classier than Rayford Johnson, man, who exudes class, and uh, and Ving Rhames, and we're backstage, and somebody's giving like one of them long ass speeches, and we're literally just sitting how the three of us are sitting right here, and I go to Ving Rhames, I go, hey man, I got to tell you something. He goes, what is it, little man? <laughs> I go, I was on the road late at night, and I was flipping through the channels, and uh, on, on pay per view, I was in Phoenix. I go, I'm in Phoenix. I'm doing uh, this comedy club stand up live, and I, I watched Baby Boy. And it's not, so, I don't know why. I just watched it. And I got to tell you something. You were so great in that movie. And I don't know, it wasn't a, like a big hit, but if it means anything to you, like you were incredible in that movie. He goes, I appreciate that very much. And I go, How, I got to tell you. You were just a regular guy with two strikes. But when you come into the kitchen and you choke Tyrese from behind, it was like Freddy Krueger, Jason. You know the scene I'm talking about. I know like, exactly it was the scariest about. shit in the world. Because he's just a guy wearing a weightlifting belt around the house. And he works, he's like, works at a moving van company or something. But he's just Ty- he's, he Ty- he's dating Tyrese's mom. Right. And he just, they're battling, they're always arguing. And then just one day he comes home from work, sneaks up behind Tyrese, and puts him in a fucking chokehold. And it, like, I couldn't catch my breath. It scared the shit out of me. Now, I'm sitting in one of them 
way too low to the ground, big, puffy, cushy chairs where you look like a child. Right. And Bing Rames is a big, tall yeah. glass of water. And he gets down on his knees in front of me and goes, I'm glad you picked up on that, man. Because as you know, there's two ways to choke a motherfucker. <laughs> you could choke a motherfucker till he's unconscious. And as you know, and you saw in that scene, you choke a motherfucker where he knows when he wakes up, you fucked him in his ass. And I'm sitting there looking up. Now, I got to play it cool like, well, yeah, that's exactly my point. <laughs> like, I was good. that was my next sentence right, was, right. You, you literally I was the so words scared out of my mouth. when you choked him because I knew you were going to fuck, fuck his it. And I'm like, what? And they're like, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome <laughs> Jay Moore, Ving Rhames, and Olympian Rafer Johnson. And I got to go out and read teleprompter. And Ving Rhames got his arm around me as a reading prompter. I'm like, our next like guest, him. please welcome Zab Judah. Like, I'm fucking <laughs> terrified. <laughs> But he literally said to me, I'm glad you picked up on that, big man. Because you know when you woke up, you got fucked in your ass. And I'm like, what? But you know what? Maybe that's why it was so scary, because he's such a good actor. It was implied right. that if he did, in fact, choke Tyrese out to unconsciousness. Or chose to choke us. Or us. You know what I'm saying? You ain't I'm- got no problems. You fuck Ring Rings up. I, I'll go for it. I mean, I'm not going. <laughs> I love the like your I game. Said, I'm not going to just give up my asshole willingly. <laughs> I have no plans to give it up, so I'm gonna have to be asleep when that type of shit happens. Like, I well, not asleep. It. I'm gonna have to be unconscious. <laughs> have to be for. I would have to be forcibly put into a state of unconsciousness. That is the best way to get raped in your ass. If you're going if you, to go, yeah, to, if, if would, the guy's gonna, uh, you know what? He's actually doing you a service to put you to sleep first, little then rape well. your not, ass, not this, and then you just wake up bleeding with a $50 bill that, in your hand and a note that says thanks. No, not not that I normally think of that kind of a thing. No, it just because but I if, told the story. But if I had to think of that happening or, or, or something like that, then I guess that, yeah. Knock me out. I would very much appreciate it. <laughs> Hit me in the head with a frying if pan. That, you know, if I was comatose. Wow, this happened. A little necrophilia never hurt nobody. <laughs> remember, you remember that Damon Wayans joke when he was talking about uh, Mike Tyson in jail? Like, the baddest motherfucker in the world is in jail. And he goes, you know the hardest motherfucker in prison? You know, you can't be hard around Mike Tyson. Right. But, you know, Mike Tyson going to, you know, I'm talking about the baddest motherfucker in prison. Mike Tyson go, you know, I'm going to fuck you in your ass. And that hard motherfucker's going to go, yeah? For how long? <laughs> I'll give you my ass all four or five hours. You ain't fucking all day now. Like, this is one of the funniest fucking jokes. Yeah, Thank for man. how long? Wow. I'm glad you picked up on that, big man. But I'm, you got to see, Bun B. I'm sitting in a chair like this, and he this he's huge. And he just got down on his knees, this way too close to my face. And there's another way to choke a motherfucker <laughs> out. Where he knows you're going to fuck his ass. I'm glad you picked up on that. <laughs> Please welcome to the stage... And Rayford Johnson sitting right there with his crazy Elgin Baylor wig. And the band played on. And the band played on. Bun B, new album, Epilogue. It'll be out by the time this uh, podcast airs. And I'm telling anybody, if you're a fan of hip-hop, and uh, you got to make your way through Houston. And it's it's high time uh, that any time that mentions Dirty South. Uh, yeah, Atlanta's hot. And, you know, you got Mob Deep and you got... Uh, is Mob Deep from Atlanta? No, no. That's who am oh, I thinking oh, of? That's East Coast. Uh, who am I thinking of? Atlanta, but uh, Outkast. They're always with Outkast. Luda. Who's Outkast always with? Goody Mob. Goody Mob. Goody Mob and uh, Luda yeah, Chris. Yeah, Mob, right. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah and Luda Chris and, of course, Outkast. But uh, I'm telling my listeners, and my listeners know I'll never steer them wrong. This is appointment listening. Bun B. And you could pick up oh, you could pick up Trill. You could pick up Trill OG. Any of them. Any of them. And I'm telling when I say every album, every rapper, every band member, every musician has that one album that sucks a bag of dicks. Yeah. You don't. I haven't made it yet, thank God. I love it. So those listeners out there listening to this podcast, you go get Bun B, uh, and, and it's just, you can thank me later, and you can email uh, me at Jay Moore, and uh, uh, you can tweet Bun B, Bun B, very active on the Twitter board, yeah. at, Bun, it's, it's Bun B Trill OG. Bun B Trill OG. Yes. Any All last words? Word. We can't end on a Ving Rain's raping your ass joke. Nah, uh, let's end on a... Uh... 